We are going to read the story Life Without Gravity today. If you have your literature book at home, you can find this story starting on page 372 um, and follow along as I read the story because I'll stop and kind of talk about some of the things as we're going. Uh, so Life Without Gravity is a nonfiction piece of writing. Um, it's actually an expository essay. So very similar to what we have been doing in English. Um, this is one of the reasons that I picked it. Uh, so it's a short piece of nonfiction. So this is a real, uh, it has uh, information that explains topics, defines things, uh, events and processes that are all real. Um, and it's organized in a sense that it's, um, it gives you the information in an article type uh, format. And as I'm reading today, I really want you to think about what the main idea is because you will be asked that um, to figure out what that is. Um, so the main idea, and we've talked about this before, um, is the central point. So the main idea, the main um, point the author is trying to get across um, to the audience. So be thinking about that um, as we are reading. So if you just want to follow along and then I'll stop um, in a few different parts and just kind of ask you some questions for you to kind of think about. Being weightless in space seems so exciting. Astronauts bounce from wall to wall, flying. They float, they weave, they do somersaults and aer aerobatics without effort. Heavy objects can be lifted like feathers and no one ever gets tired because nothing weighs anything. In fact, everything is fun. Nothing is hard. Not. Since the first manned space missions in the 1960s, scientists have discovered that being weightless in space isn't just flying around like Superman. Zero gravity is alien stuff. As space tourist Dennis Tito said when he visited the International Space Station, living in space is like having a different life, living in a different world. Worse, weightlessness can sometimes be downright unpleasant. Your body gets upset and confused. Your face puffs up. Your nose gets stuffy. Your back hurts. Your stomach gets upset and you throw up. If astronauts are to survive a one-year journey to Mars, the shortest possible trip to the Red Planet, they will have to deal with this weird environment. So something to think about is kind of right there, it show, it's showing us the positives um, and the negatives of being up in space. Um, it's giving and so as we read this article that's what you're going to hear it's very similar to your advantage disadvantage paper that you're writing now right now our bodies our bodies are adapted to earth's gravity our muscles are strong in order to overcome gravity as we walk and run our inner ears use gravity to keep us upright and because gravity wants to pull all of our blood down into our legs, our hearts are designed to pump hard to get blood up to our brains. In space, the much weaker gravity makes the human body change in many unexpected ways. In microgravity, your blood is rerouted, flowing from your legs, which become thin and stick-like, to the head, which swells up. The extra liquid in your head also makes you feel like you're hanging upside down or have a stuffed up nose. The lack of gravity causes astronauts to routinely grow between one and three inches taller. Their spines straighten out. Their bones in the spine and the discs between them spread apart and relax. But their bones also get thin and spongy. Their body decides that if the muscles aren't going to push and pull on the bones, it doesn't need to lay down as much bone as it normally does. Astronauts who have been in space for several months can lose 10% or more of their bone tissue. If their bones got much weaker, they would snap once the astronauts returned to Earth. And their muscles get weak and flabby. Floating about in space is too easy. 
If astronauts don't force themselves to exercise, their muscles become so feeble that they, when they return to Earth, they can't even walk. Worst of all is how their stomachs feel. During the first few days in space, the inner ear, which gives people their sense of balance, gets confused. Many astronauts become nauseous. They lose their appetites. Many throw up. Many throw up a lot. Weightlessness isn't all bad, however. After about a week, people usually get used to it. Their stomachs settle down. Appetites return. Though astronauts always say that the food tastes blander in space, their heart and spine adjust. So I want you to stop and think about the sentence that lets us know that they're changing from the disadvantages, which we heard a lot of the disadvantages, all the bad things that can happen and can affect them. And what one sentence lets us know that now we're going to start talking about the positives, the good things. Then flying around like a bird becomes fun. Rooms suddenly seem much bigger. Look around you. The space above your head is pretty useless on Earth. You can't get up there to work, and anything you attach to the ceiling is something you'll bump your head on. In space, however, the area is useful. In fact, In fact, equipment can be installed on every inch of every wall. In weightlessness, you choose to move up or down and left or right simply by pointing your head. If you turn yourself upside down, the ceiling becomes the floor. And you can't drop anything. As you work, you can let your tools float around you. But you better be organized and neat. If you don't put things back where they belong, when you are finished, Tying them down securely, they will float away. Air currents will blow them into nooks and crannies, and it might take you days to find them again. In microgravity, you have to learn new ways to eat. Don't try pulling a bowl of cornflakes. Not only will the flakes float all over the place, the milk won't pour. Instead, big balls of milk will form. You can drink these by taking big bites out of them, but you'd better finish them before they smash into a wall, splattering apart and covering everything in little tiny milk globules. Some meals on the space station are eaten with forks and knives, but scooping food with a spoon doesn't work. If the food isn't gooey enough to stick to the spoon, it will float away. Everyone in space drinks through a straw, since, sim, since liquid simply refuses to stay in a glass. The straw has to have a clamp at one end, or else when you stop drinking, the liquid will continue to flow out, spilling everywhere. To prevent their muscles and bones from becoming too weak for life on Earth, astronauts have to follow a boring two-hour exercise routine every single day. Imagine having to run on a treadmill for one hour in the morning and then ride an exercise bicycle another hour before dinner. As Russian astronaut Valery Rubin once said, yuck. Even after all this exercise, astronauts who spend more than two months in space are usually weak and uncomfortable when they get back to Earth. Jerry Lininger, who spent more than four months on the Russian, Russian space station Mir struggled to walk after he returned. My body felt like a 500-pound barbell, he said. He even had trouble lifting and holding his 15-month-old son, John. When Lindenberg went to bed that first night, his body felt like it was being smashed into the mattress. He was constantly afraid that if he moved too much, he would float away and out of control. So think about if you have ever, I know I've had this happening, like if I've done an activity like roller skating or swimming or being on a roller coaster or something for long periods of time, when you stop, you kind of still feel like your body's moving. That's very similar to what the astronauts are feeling. And yet, Leninger recovered quickly. In fact, almost two dozen astronauts have lived in space for more than six months, and four have stayed in orbit for more than a year. 
These men and women faced the discomforts of weightlessness and overcame them, and they all readapted to Earth's gravity without problems, proving that voyages to Mars are possible, even if it feels like you are hanging upside down the whole time. So think about why would this be an expository? Think about what we talked about with our advantage-disadvantage paper. Are there facts in here? Are there expert opinions? Are there anecdotes? There are all of those. And so it's giving us, it's defining things. It's giving us facts. It's everything that makes it expository. It's giving us um, explaining the processes of these.